Good afternoon and welcome back. Again, I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us this afternoon, whether it is in person or watching us live for this very important event, Cayman Proud, a time to remember. And truly, what better time for us to reminisce and appreciate the beauty of our culture. We are a unique people and that we should be extremely proud of. For those of you that were here with us this morning, I am sure you will agree with me that the information seemed as if it was just getting started. We could have rolled it into the afternoon and then started to hear about some of their stories. But we have an afternoon session that is going to be equally as exciting. And I am sure you will find it absolutely amazing and enjoyable to be able to hear the panel discussion that will take us into the areas of culture, Caymanian culture. Is it something that we are indeed retaining, appreciating, or are we losing it along the way? Once again, it is my pleasure to call on the Minister for Youth Sports, Culture, and Heritage, the Honorable Bernie Bush, to bring a few remarks. Good afternoon. And for those of you who have remained here from this morning, thank you. And for those of you who are just coming back, welcome back. This morning was very enjoyable and educational. And it was a good thing that Austin had the, the uh, diplomatic way of slowing some people down because the people he had there were so passionate. They could have gone on for, they could have still been talking now if you had left them alone. But it shows you how much we have to share, how much we have to learn. And to the people this morning, to the panelists this morning, thank you all very much again. This afternoon was, is the session that I was really looking forward to. And in between the break, a lot of people said to me, you said you want ideas on how to make these better. You've been given some very good ideas that when we do the postmortem on this evening, myself and the chief officers and the staff uh, will go take a lot of those into consideration. I think they do make sense because after watching Dr. Roy Borden's symposium here a few months back, which I thought that symposium should be in every school, should be everywhere for every Caymanian to see, I'm hoping that we will do a job that we will get to that level of what his symposium was. And this afternoon is especially important for me because two of the panelists that was here shows you some of what the Caymanian heritage was. And that because where I'm standing right now, I'm standing because of two people who are sitting here today. One, because of unforeseen circumstances, Mr. Oswald Sonnyboy Rankin, he, did, he has not made it. He's still attempting to. Back in 1988, I applied for a scholarship. The minister for the day turned me down flat. But a simple, I don't think he can handle a course of that magnitude. Two or three weeks later, the minister went on vacation. Mr. Rankin called me in, helped me write a letter to appeal to the governor. Now, of course, it's him saying what I must write. I wrote down what he said. Sent it to the governor. The governor gave the appeal. He asked Mr. Rankin, where would the money come from? There was nothing in the budget. He says, yes, I have equipment money. I don't need equipment until he comes back. Sent me off to England. That was one case. Another case was 1980 at the Cayman Islands High School, now known as the John Gray School. I got into a fight, and a certain teacher grabbed me up and told me that don't make him see me fighting again. I thought it was because I'd beat up two boys at the same time from his district. <laughs> and he said, there are certain people in your class that can never come down to the little man's level. And some of those little men cannot go to that level. You have the ability to go both directions. You're a bridge 
your future leader for this country. That man was Mr. Roy Boyd, and sitting right there. That was the culture of educated people, or people who knew. Mr. Oswald Rankin, my own beloved mother who adopted me from the day I was born, she used to say, don't follow them because they into this black power. That's what they used to say about it. And Mr. Borden can probably tell you he probably heard it too. But it was said about Mr. Rankin more than most. I got to know the man. It was not black power. It was education. He wanted the little man to have access to education. And I was so proud this evening when they had agreed to sit here. And then I look at Mr. Steve McField, who has always fought. And then you have the younger set coming through. Miss Alex, I have had much personal dealings with her, but I know what other young people have told me about her. Nasaria is the youngest one, but I know what she has also tried to pass on to the younger people. So this afternoon, I think we have a first-class panel, and I do hope and I'm looking forward that people will listen carefully to what is said. I don't like the sound of my voice. I'm sure you don't. Thank you all very much for having me, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you again, Minister, for those remarks and for getting this afternoon session started with a good laugh. I am so pleased today that I'm able to say, Minister is not here fighting and giving anybody black eyes, but he is continuing to fight the fight to ensure that culture and heritage stays alive in our beautiful Cayman Islands. And for that, we are most grateful. Before I hand things over to the moderator, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge someone very special in our ministry and to wish them a happy birthday in advance. Miss Lisa Welcome, birthday is tomorrow, and we want to wish her a very, very happy birthday. Lisa's absolutely amazing. She contributes in every way to the ministry. I don't know where she is. If she heard her name, she's probably somewhere now hiding from me. Yeah. <laughs> but Lisa goes above and beyond when it comes to her work. And she is involved with everything. She played such a major role in getting today organized. And it is no exception in terms of anything that we give to her. She ensures that the work gets done. She is an amazing asset to the Ministry of Youth, Sports, Culture, and Heritage. And she's always doing whatever she does with that warm Cayman kind attitude and smile. So we want to wish Miss Lisa a very happy birthday when it comes tomorrow. Um, we had Dr. Frank here with us earlier on. We're hoping that he will join us um, later for the afternoon. But his birthday too is on Sunday and we want to say a special um, happy birthday to Dr. Frank. And I'm not sure if I have it correct, but Dr. Roy, do you have a birthday this month as well, sir? Oh, lovely. So Dr. Frank and Dr. Roy will be celebrating their birthdays on Sunday, and Lisa celebrates her birthday um, on Saturday. So all three of them, we want to wish you all a very happy birthday, and may God continue to bless you. Without any further delays, I want to hand things uh, back over to our moderator, um, Mr. Austin Harris who has done an extremely, extremely beautiful job um, this morning, very skillful, keeping everybody um, on time and um, yet ensuring that they had the opportunity to say what they wanted to say and um, got their thoughts out this morning. So again, thank you very much, Mr. Harris, and I turn it over to you, sir. Thank you so very much, uh, Chief Officer Teresa Echeniki, and certainly to our guests. Thank you again to the Honorable Minister uh, for, first of all, planning and putting events like this together and allowing me uh, to, to be in such distinguished company. Uh, welcome back, and welcome to those who are just joining us. 
uh, for this afternoon session of this special cultural event, Caymanian Proud, a time to remember. The afternoon session, as has been already expressed, features a panel discussion on the subject, Caymanian culture, are we retaining and appreciating it, or are we losing it in today's modern world? Um, judging from the experience of our morning session, we started out setting a time limit of five minutes per person, uh, but with the reduction in panel members and, again, giving a bit more freedom on the subject matter, we're working about an average of about eight minutes uh, per panelist. Uh, unlike the morning discussion where we encourage members to speak specifically on a subject and we tended to move around quite frequently, I'm hoping that um, this panel conversation will be just that, a conversation, person sharing views on other expressions being made. Uh, but to begin, let us begin by introducing uh, our panel. We begin with Mrs. Nasaria Suku Shalet. Ms. Suku Shalet is a storyteller, poet, artist, and cultural activist. Nasaria has published two books, Storytelling Rundown and All the Joy in the World, and has had her poetry published locally and internationally. She's a founding member of the Caymanian Artists Collective, Native Sons, since 1996. Please put your hands together for our panelist, Mrs. Nasaria Suku Shile. Thank you. As we heard earlier on, our next panelist is certainly uh, no stranger uh, to these types of discussions or education in general. Uh, Mr. J.A. Roy Bodden is a cultural historian, published author, and is President Emeritus of the University College of the Cayman Islands, better known as UCCI. Please welcome Mr. J.A. Roy Bodden. Uh, our next panelists, uh, hailing, I believe, from the district, beautiful district of Northside, um, Mrs. Alex Johnson, JP. She's the eldest of eight children born to Cornwell and Leela Ebanks of the lovely district of Northside. She has a passion for seniors, which she attributes to her father. Please welcome Miss, Mrs. Alex Johnson. Thank you. Uh, certainly last but not least, joining us from this morning's panel discussion and rejoining us this afternoon, um, local attorney and barrister, Dr. A. Steve McField. Dr. McField has served as the clerk of the courts and crown counsel in the Cayman Islands. Dr. McField was a founder of the Caymanian Bar Association and served as its vice president and president. Dr. McField possesses an enormous wealth of knowledge on the history and culture of the Cayman Islands for which he has an unshakable love, Dr. A. Steve McField. And Mr. Moderator, if I may, just before you continue, I want for us to please pause and say a special welcome to His Excellency the Governor, Mr. Martin Roper and Mrs. Roper. We're so grateful that you were able to join us this afternoon. Indeed, welcome Your Excellency and also if I may also echo, uh, happy birthday to Ms. Lisa, uh, Dr. Frank, and Mr. Roy Borden when those birthdays come around. Uh, we will begin the panel conversation with Ms. Nasario Suku and alternate from there. Ms. Nasario, I guess to begin the conversation on the subject, Caymanian culture, are we retaining and appreciating it or are we losing it in this modern age called Cayman? Uh, you have eight minutes. To, to prove my point. <laughs> to prove your point. Um, I would agree that we are losing it. Um, and I say this because if we had been talking about is it lost, I would have said no. Because until that last person who experienced those things passes and has not passed it down to somebody else, it's not lost, it's dormant. But right now we are losing a lot of our heritage because we're not finding new and contemporary ways to interpret it and to share it. And, and that is the way to preserve it. I mean, there's only so many ground baskets a person needs nowadays. But if you can take those skills and you can turn them into contemporary art or functional pieces that are a mixture of the then and the now, 
then that's the way that we can have um, longevity for our heritage and culture. But it's also a way that we can connect with the younger generations so that we're not preaching at them. Yes. We're actually just, and it doesn't do any good from experience teaching to put down what they're into now because then they're offended and they don't want to hear what you're talking about. But if we present it with the joy that, that those of us who lived it, lived it, if we can present it in that way, in that positive way, they are very open to it. And we need to stop limiting our young people and feeling that they can't really connect. And I'll give you an example. My last year of teaching at Clifton Hunter High School, um, Swanky came in and they just started playing. And I'm telling you, those young people, they pushed the chairs over. They were dancing. They were dancing with the elders. I believe Miss Olive was there. And they were dancing with her. And they were having a great time. So it, they, we just need to do a better job at collecting the information. Now, we talk about losing what we already know. What about all the bits that we don't know? For instance, our history in Rotan, our history in Isla Pines, our history in Nicaragua, San Andres and those places. What about things we take for granted, like words we say that we never check to see, well, why do we say Anna? Right. Anna doesn't sound like you. It's not like we took a word and just changed it, um, but it actually is a Congo language word. And so there are loads of words, jug, kata, double, the double word emphasis, good, good, back, back. Um, you stayed a um, nana and rag ragin. All those things are all from Africa. We are not doing enough to know, to acknowledge, say, this is culture, what is that? And the last thing I want to say is, um, I tend to look at heritage and culture <laughs> in two different ways, although we use them interchangeably. But heritage to me is like rundown. There are all these parts that went into it, and then it became better than the sum of its parts. That is set, that is heritage. We, we're not going back to redo heritage, it is there. And then culture is something that changes and grows as new people move here, as their culture comes here, it becomes intertwined. And eventually, years to come, some of those things may be part, become part of heritage, but it takes a long time for that to happen. And so we shouldn't despair about culture but we should be concerned about our heritage and how much we don't know now. Thank you so very much. Nisari Osuku. Inviting our second panelist to uh, again share his introductory remarks on the panel discussion, Caymanian culture, are we retaining and appreciating it or are we losing it in this modern Cayman? We turn now to Dr. Roy Bodman uh, for his thoughts. Well, Mr. Moderator, I would say that we are certainly making an effort, however small now, to retain it. But we are losing some, and indeed, we've, we've lost some. I am at the age where I reflect a lot about the former time. And growing up in Borden Town, which was at one stage the political capital of these islands, I realized how fortunate I was, especially as I grew up at a place called Guard House, which was the headquarters of the militia when Borden Town was the capital. And the house where I grew up was the gathering point for many of the old men of the village. They would come by in the evenings to gather and what they call spin yarn, Nasaria. Sometimes they would interchange that expression with, they would say, chewing the rag. And as a youngster, I would eavesdrop and I would hear all of the tales of the exploits of these men who had spent time in Honduras, Nicaragua, Cuba, and other regional places. As a matter of fact, many of them were bilingual. And there were two brothers, William McCoy, we call him Bill Ration, 
and his brother Henry McCoy. They spoke Spanish like grandees, and they were often joined by a man called Nat Tatum, which we call Ongnare. And I heard all these tales of their exploits, and I kept them in my chest. And when I was a school teacher, I went to the hamlet of East End from 1970 to 1975. And I'd often read on a Friday evening. I would give my class a treat by reading them stories. And I would say to them, all of these stories come from islands like Jamaica and Trinidad and Barbados. But there are no stories about Cape Ann. And yet we have stories like this. I know because I heard the old men repeat them over and often. One of these days, I'm going to write. And so I did, thank God. And it's to those old men that I give credit. I absolutely revere them. And there's something else that we celebrated in Borden Town, John Canoe. Now, John Canoe is an African animist celebration. And the John Canoe troop was all men. And some of the men dressed as women. And they were characters, pitchy patchy. They had cow head, horse head, the clown. And every January, New Year's Day, the John Canoe would come from Gun Square with the top band, all the men. And they would come marching down the street, parading, performing tricks, doing things like simple juggling. And they would go down to the manse, the Presbyterian home of the priest, home of the Presbyterian priest at the manse where they would have a big garden party. And at that garden party, they had all kinds of exhibitions. And I remember the women danced the maypole, mm -hmm. the maypole. Some people call it flat pole. As a youngster, I was awed at these women. They would dance and they would weave, weave this. They had these ribbons. And they would dance and weave them into a pattern. And they would dance again and unweave them. Skill. As a youngster, I stood there spellbound with all this stuff. What happened to it? When modernity came and we opened up, I can tell you what happened to the John Canoe. The men went to sea. The men who were the John Canoe troop went to sea. And the John Canoe was discontinued. The garden party went on for a couple of years after. And then that too continued. But some of these activities, like the Maypole, went out. And the young women didn't learn to dance. And then there was the vocabulary that Nazario spoke about. All the words that, that uh, and sometimes some of them were not really complimentary because uh, the Africans had their way of speaking about their white masters. And one of the things that the Africans like to talk about, the Bakra, that's what they call the white people. Like how the white people would call them niggas, they would call the white people Bakra. Mm -hmm. And in Cayman, they often described them as poor Bakras mm -hmm. because there were a lot of poor whites in Cayman. Then I know all the things about what they use for their hygiene. Castor oil was the pomade they used to soften the hair made out of the castor oil beans. And then they had a kind of cactus, cochineal, cochineal. Which, which they pounded and used as a shampoo to soften the hair. And then they made wigs out of sisal, which is another kind of cactus. They beat it to, it to threads, and they dyed it whatever color they wanted. And there was a famous wig maker in Borden Town who made wigs for the ladies out of sisal. So all these things, all, all these things are gone. And then we had in our cuisine, Guinea corn. Corn from Guinea came from Guinea in West Africa. That was a staple when I was growing up, Guinea corn porridge. And you had to eat that if you wanted to be strong. My grandmother said, take this bowl of Guinea corn porridge, boy. You need it for the little paper bag chest you have. <laughs> <laughs> and bulrush porridge. Right. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Roy, for those comments. And certainly, again, uh, again tying in 
I think uh, food is just as much as our culture as some of the history books we read. So we thank you very much for that. And we will be coming back on some of the points you raised because I think you've, you've, you've touched on a number of areas that I'd like to invite the panel to, to, to engage in as the afternoon continues. Uh, turning to Ms. Mrs. Alex Johnson, uh, likewise an opportunity to offer your introductory remarks uh, on today's panel discussion. Caymanian culture, are we retaining and appreciating it or are we losing it in today's modern Cayman? Well, I, for me, I, I Sat and thought about this when Lisa called me, and, and I'm like, I'm not old enough to know about the history, of, but I did experience a lot of it. And the things like what Ms. Ms. Masari was saying about what we've lost. For me in Northside, I think back to like what Mr. Roy just said about the food stuff. When the women, as when my father and all the men went to sea, the women did the farming. I carried many a basket on my head with pumpkins and potatoes and whatnot, you know, when, when I had to go with my mom in the, in the farm. We, women took care of everything back in those days. I mean, going into the farms, building the house. technical difficulty, but hopefully it's Somewhere. been resolved. Please continue. My, my memories and in, 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 uh, all the things that my mom had to do more so than my dad had to do, because my dad started as a policeman. He was out. My mom was still at home. So the history today for me is with the women are working today in offices, banks, and so forth, but the kind of life that my mom and, her, and all the other women had to live to take care of this mess and work in that. that they had to go out and work at home, in the yards, in the farm. And people aren't appreciating what those ladies did back in those days. My mom built her house, mm -hmm. her first house. My mom, my dad was off to sea. But we had to go on the beach and get the sand and get the rocks and do so, so forth. The man came and laid it out what it's supposed to be, but my mother pressed down those rocks and poured that concrete in, and so the house that I grew up in was done by a woman. And I think a lot more women should be given more appreciation. The culture is like we're lo the women are losing what they really fought for, actually. Indeed. Indeed. Because the women couldn't vote. I remember when the women, for the first, my aunt, still have a paper of the first people that, in Northside that voted. So we, the history of, of the women is what I. If I may, if I just may make a, a suggestion, if we could, well, I know we at Caymanians talk with our hands, uh, but try not to touch your chest or your microphone, because your, your chest is where your microphone is. And I don't know whether or not that is contributing to the. So just try to keep that in mind, all of us. Uh, but are you finished? We'll come yeah. back to you, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do that. All right. Well, thank you so very much. Please, Miss uh, Alex Johnson and her comments. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, Dr. Steve McBeal, your thoughts on the panel discussion at hand, Caymanian culture. Are we retaining and appreciating it, or are we losing it in modern-day Cayman? which is cultural nationalities, then we have to start to, con to consider whether we have lost our culture or we're losing it. You must understand that we have not been a people who actually um, thought about our culture in the sense that we were competing against any anybody else. Remember now that we were an island that nobody wanted. As I said this morning, we were not good enough for Jamaica. 
on the British government um, didn't recognize us. We were, we were in, no, in nowhere, no man's land, left out here in the Caribbean so on our own. And so the culture that we developed here was a, was a, was, was a culture of, of, uh, of existence, bare existence on the, on the land and the sea. And that is why we have a, 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 mostly a sea culture. But bear in mind as it may, when you have so many people from different nationalities and different cultures that they claim that are more advanced than we are, you're going to have a lot of competition. And something has to resist. And, and when you have people who come from other places and believe that their culture is superior to your culture, then even though they may, may be the minority, their culture also can trump our culture. In other words, can succumb our culture. And that is what's been happening in Cayman, I would say from the 1970s onwards. It was that time that we lost our innocence, our cultural innocence. And, um, and then we, we started believing what other people say about us, that we're lazy, that we're, that we're, we're, we're not dependable, and so forth. We are dependable people. We, we, we've come a long way. What we have done to survive on this little island, many people in, in the large cities of Europe, in the metropoles of North America and South America could never have, have, have gone through those things. So, for instance, one of the things that uh, Dr. Roy Borden spoke about was the, um, the cultural aspects of the, of the garden parties and, uh, and, and stuff in Borden Town. We lost that because other people came here and said that that was not good enough, that that was not good. It was pagan, and that it was unchristian, and they closed it down, and we accepted it. We never fought back and said, I'm sorry, but this is part of who we are. We also, they're also uh, in, in Georgetown, and right behind where the government house is now, was a community called Scranton. It was uh, sort of the... Um, the black renaissance of Cayman, where the, the commissioner, every Easter and every uh, uh, Boxing Day, provided money for a fund, provided provide a fund for fun, a, a, a money for, for fun. They had the same things they had in Borden Town. They had the Maypole. They had the merry-go-rounds. They had the cake sales. They had the greaser pole, where the commissioner would put a watch on top a grease the pole, like an old huge pole, and you had to climb it. People had to bring their old clothes. And, and when they got to grease it, put on another set of clothes to climb it. And that was the place where every New, East, every, um, New Year's Day and Boxing Day, they would have dances and fun. And the fiddlers would come out and fiddle. And the drummers would come out and drum. And people would go out there with dancing with their children and their aunts and their uncles and Every generation was out there in those places. That was put on by, 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 the, by the commissioner. I remember Commissioner Smith, uh, Commissioner Gerard, and, um, and so forth. They would come out there and they would come among the people. We had the town, the town hall dances. That was a cultural aspect of Cayman, although they were segregated, where you had the white dances and the colored dances. And when the warships come in, and you had the governor from Jamaica who came down with the royal with the Royal Marines and stuff for two or three days, and they would have um, dances there. I remember, one time the the local uh, Gentile came to Commissioner uh, Gerard and said, "You know, I came for the money. So how dances for for us today, tonight, and for the for those colored people the next night?" And uh, Commissioner. Uh, Gerard, who was a, an, a man, a shoot man who, who the local gente didn't like too well, um, said, said, well, that was a surprise to him. Anyway, he went along with it, gave them the money. So what they would do, they would have the white people's dance in the town hall one night, and would have the colored people dance in the old courthouse, which is now the museum, the next night. Partly so because, I mean, to be fair, they only had one band that came out at that time. Jim Thomas and the Happy Boys, you know, and so forth. So you could only have one, one, one dance if you had one, one band. And Commissioner Gerard decided that he was going to break up the segregation in George and came in for once, once and for all. 
So what he did, he, um, he arranged for a man called Sky Blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Malachi Connor. Sky Blue, who had just, but by the way, we used to have the best dress man contest in those days, so in the quadrille, and under, under quadrille contest from, with, by districts. And old Malachi Connor had um, just won the best dress man contest the night before. Double breasted cream serge suit. You know, the, 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 the uh, Fandora hat. And, um, and he also connected, uh, uh, connected with a woman called Miss Annie Connor, who was a great dancer. And he decided that they were going to come out to the town hall that night. And as his signal, they were going to come into the town hall and he was going to dance with Mrs. Anna Connor, and Gerard was going to give his wife to dance with Sky Blue, old Malachi Connor. So, dance hot and heavy. They all dancing there, you know, the governors, uh, Marines with their high collars and their uniforms. And by the way, and the white people too, um, used those occasions for their white daughters to, be, to marry to white men from England. From to 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 to, to have to, to white, keep their family white. That's, that was a, one of the reasons for them for the, for them. And so, old Gerard went around nine ten o'clock. The dance was hot and heavy. Went outside and brought Miss Anna Connor in sky blue in. Gave his wife sky blue to dance with. And old old uh, 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 sky blue is black as the ace of spade. And um, and Miss Anna's gonna high brown, what my grandmother would call L B D and W, light <laughs> bright and damn near white. That's what my grandmother would call those people. <laughs> and and uh, and 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 the dance went on. And when the white people saw that Gerard had brought all these these people into the dance who were not white, they all started leaving. And Commissioner Gerard stopped the music. And he says, all the people who were not civil servants, they can leave. But anybody who the civil servants leave, they're going to be fired. And <laughs> the civil servant who was, the, who was the, the civil servant at the time, who was the, who was the highest paid man in Georgetown and Cayman Islands was Truman Borden's father, Mr. Arthur, Mr. Arthur State Borden. He was the wireless operator. He was, the, he was in charge of the Met station. He was in charge of uh, the, the Cuban meteorological station that the Cuban had with, with the, in the Caribbean. And he was a printer for the government, printing all the, all the stationery and everything. So he was, he was, he was the, the creme de la creme. And he decided to leave. And Gerard fired him that night on the spot. Stripped him of his heat flats and fired him that night on the spot. Wow. And so those are some of the things that, that was part of our culture. Now, the problem that we have now with so many different people, and I saw it in Canada with the Indians when I lived there, the 19 years I spent in Canada. When you come from a, a different culture and you believe that your culture is superior to the other people's culture, there's only one thing that has to happen. They have to resist or become exterminated. And this is what happens to people who resist. They get exterminated or you have to capitulate. What we have been doing in Cayman is we have been capitulating to other people's culture now, I would say, since the 1960s and 70s and 80s, to the point now where we, they, 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 they can say about us now in our own land that we're stupid, we're lazy, and the jobs that we held and the prestige that we got from abroad um, doesn't matter. Are, are no longer relevant, and we accept that. And we, just, it's just like, it's just like, when two male dogs meet, one male dog has to has has to overcome the other one, and and the one that's dominant, he overcomes the one, and then the other one puts his tail behind his legs, bow down, so that there's not a fight, because he doesn't want to lose. That's where we are in Cayman now. Our whole, for instance, for instance, the the. The, the, the fact that the way we speak, which is part of our culture, like every other Caribbean country has this idiosyncrasies. They have a, a, place, a, a place in their culture where they use good English, as we call it, 
and where they use bad English. It's like, it's, it's like what they used to say in the old days. Oh, you know, um, let me tell you something. I don't want my daughter to marry him because, boy, he got bad hair. <laughs> and, 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 you know, he's gonna, he's, he, he, he don't look like my family. And so those are the things that we're losing as part of who we actually are. And it's like I said this morning, Cayman is more than Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King, and it's more than CNB and the other banks. We are a resilient people. What we have done here, when I tell us, when I was at the United Nations and I told a story about Cayman, people couldn't believe it. Says, "Is this really, really?" I mean, I wonder if we could stick a pin there, uh, but surely to come back to those stories that we were talking about. Uh, but first of all, Dr. Steve McField and his uh, viewpoints on the panel discussion. Are we Caymanian culture? Are we retaining and appreciating it, or are we losing it? Um, I think if we look at the ratio of the panelists, four out of four believe that we are losing Cayman culture. Um, only one of you, Dr. Roy, um, noted that there are attempts being made to preserve it, I think his words were, but you know, are we losing it or have we lost it? My question is, first of all, to, to Dr. Roy, because you said that we're making attempts to preserve it, I wonder if you can share in your opinion what we're doing well to preserve the culture of the Cayman Islands, but also likewise in the same breath, when we say we're losing or it has, it has been lost, perhaps you can narrow that down. Is it an oral history? Is it a written history? Is it a personal history? And by that I mean when we lose a member of society, a precious piece of that Caymanian culture dies with them. Uh, Dr. Roy Bud. First of all, I, I want to define what I mean when I speak of culture. So when I speak of culture, I'm talking about the ideas, the social activities, and the philosophies we have as a people or as a society. So that's my definition of culture. On to your second point. Our culture is unique in the sense that it is an oral culture up to this point. We are just beginning to write now. Some people are just beginning to articulate in black and white. But before that, it was oral. And that's the advantage outsiders have on us. And that's what they use to try to belittle us. Because our tales, our heroics, and our traditions and heritage was passed down orally. That's why I said I enjoyed listening to the old men. Because I realized that what they were saying I didn't read in any book about Cayman because we didn't have it. But I, I, when I went to Jamaica to college, I encountered that. That's why I could tell my students, we have these stories. It is just that they're not written. And one of these days, they're going to be written because I am going to write them. But when I listened to those old men and I saw them, how they performed, I knew that they were heroes. They could rape any part of the world these are people who learned a language. I, I, even although I couldn't understand what they were saying, I felt good when I heard them speaking Spanish. I was like, wow, you know, powerful. And they were talking among themselves. And then when you heard of how they conducted themselves in the diaspora, as I call it, because I, I was steeped in this. My own mother was born in Cuba. So I know, I, I learned from her about tales of Caymanians abroad. And I could do a comparative <coughs> analysis to see that we were really no different. The only difference was that we didn't have books that you could go in the library and read about our people. But I know the heroes. And I want to say something in kudos to, to, to Dr. McPhail. There are three of us, and we're brothers, he, Gilbert, and I. And when we meet, it's too bad the public can't be in on these calls. We have the fondest of times. Right, right. And now we're at the stage where we lament and we wonder what's going to happen when we are no longer on the stage. So it's important now for us to go beyond the oral storytelling and document these things for the younger generations. And back to Nasaria's point, the, young, the younger people are interested. It is just how we present it to them. 
But they want to know, they want to know who are we, where did we come from? And I hear the tales of the famous, we had an old man in Borden Town, call him Unc Reed. Eh? His name was Reed Green. And in the old Cayman, one of the things that we did, we always applied tears of endearment to our elders. Aunt, eh? Uncle. They were no, they were, okay. They were no real relatives, but there was a tear of endearment, term of endearment and respect. Or sometimes we call cousin, cousin, con so and so, con so and so. Con Leah. Con Leah and all these kind of people. And I remember, I remember these people. This old man, Reed Green, a famous fiddler. He would go in the morning, make a fiddle, and come back in the time for the kitchen dance at night <laughs> and play his fiddle. He and his brother, Halford Green, I heard these tales, and they would join up with some other people at every boat launch. That would be the celebration, every wedding. And they would have kitchen dances, informal dances in someone's kitchen. That was how they enjoyed themselves. And I want to say this too. The practice of obia. Mm. Obia was outlawed because the white masters didn't understand the African animist celebration. And so on our law books today, it is still an offense, yes. but it is a misunderstood offense. And if you get into, if you get into it and you study about obia and myalism, it has to do with healing and curing, but because the white people didn't understand it. I'll give you this final example, the quadrille. You know where the quadrille came from? The quadrille was the black people's interpretation of the white European dance, a waltz right. in four parts. That's why they call it quadrille. The African peoples were illiterate. They couldn't read and write, so they transposed it as best they could by ear, and that's where our quadrille dance comes from. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm getting quite the education mm -hmm. just sitting here, and certainly we hope our audience is as well. And by well. the way, yes? quad the, quadrille, the quadrille dance was a, a very important part of our culture because it, it, was, it was a district competition dance. That's right. I remember one, uh, one dance they had, I was young, but I was out with my mom, and uh, you know, we'd go out for the town hall and we'd sleep all night until the dance was finished and your mother would say, let's go home. And there was a cultural um, contest between um, East End and Georgetown. And it was obvious that East End had won that year. But of they course. stole the trophy and they gave it to Georgetown. <laughs> and I was out there when an, the argument started. Now, where the town clock is now and the, and the town hall, to me, as a boy, that was a big space. Yes. Man, now it looks so small when, when, when you go there. And there was an argument between a man called Mr. Massey from Georgetown and Mr. Burnell from East End. East End. They were the two lead dancers from the two different districts. And of course, Mr. Massey was a coward, but he came across as a big, brave man. He was there. He says, you got to have, but don't let, May was his wife. Good, it's a good thing May holding me tonight. Otherwise, it's going to be hell out, out here. May is say, you better hold me, better hold me, don't be, better not let me go today. Otherwise, it's going to be a fight out here. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was making all those guests out and Mr. Bonner said, let him go. Mm. Let him go. And she said, you better let me go here tonight. <laughs> and, then, and, and he slipped out of May's clutches. And Mr. Bernard went, boom, and hit Mr. Masse. And Mr. Masse went down on the ground. And the women said, in those days, the women went to dances and they had fans. Yeah. The arrow <laughs> the fans were so hard. There was no electricity then and no air, no air condition. Fan him, fan him, bring him back too. Bring him too. Go and get some water from the town hall and put on him. Take off his jacket. And when they took off Mr. Masse's jacket, all Mr. Masse had was the cuffs and the collar, but no shirt on any. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever said our culture and history wasn't without its humor. But don't uh, shut her in the knee. No, indeed, and no, so, indeed. And another thing too, Mr. Moderator, the, the, the culture of, of the marches, 
that was a part of our culture. We grew up with that from generation to generation to generation. Every Christmas Eve night, the shops would close at 12 o'clock, and the men would gather, sometimes Sorry. two, three hundred men, and they would march. Sorry. They would go to every house. They would carry wheelbarrows sometimes, put all their, all their booty in it. People gave them alcohol, people gave them money, people gave them cash, people gave them everything. And then they would go to every house in Georgetown, and they would sit, they would play the music. And they had an old man called Tommy, who played the clarinet, and he was blind, he couldn't see. And when he got so drunk, two men would hold him up on his arm, and would be blowing his clarinet, and they would beat, beat the drums and the maracas and the guitars. And, um, and they, would, they, would, they, would, they would end up in Scranton where they would share the money, and then they would have a big dance. And so one morning, Christmas, my, my mother said, you're old enough now to follow the men. So I went out with the men that night, me and my friend. And we fell asleep on the road, because we couldn't, we, and, and when we, we woke up, we couldn't find where the music was. We were up in South Sound, but we found, we, Georgetown is dark, no electricity, because the electricity would come on at three o'clock and go, on, go, go up at seven o'clock in the night. And we followed, we found them down, a nor, down north. It's supposed to be up north, but we used to say down north. And that morning, we followed them down to Scranton. And we heard that there was going to be a dance, in, a, a fight in Scranton. And, um, and so we, we was wondering, like, who, 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 who's going to be in this fight? We heard it was Leon, a guy called Leon Bird, who had married a, one of those L, light, bright, damn near white women from Northside. <laughs> and um, in those days, LBD and W's women in Georgetown was a, was a, was a prize, because Georgetown mostly had all the black the black people in Georgetown and the whites and blacks, there was no hardly any in between. And so the LBD and W Bone Company came on Brock, they would come from the north side and from West Bay. And they were a prize to have. Charlie Martin had one. Mr. Rupert had, had one wife who was the LBD and W. And then Leon Bird had this one. And then I we heard that we heard we, we heard but that, that, that this that this other man now um, I think he was a Miles in. Miles in was like six foot eight. And he used to walk like this because he was so big. He, he wore number 20 shoes. And he would walk like this to keep, to keep balance. And we heard Leon was waiting for him that morning in the Guinea grass with his machete sharpened. And when the band came, struck up the music, hip, the holy glory, hallelujah, glory, the glory, hallelujah. As we go marching along, England got the money and Jamaica got the rum. England got the money and Jamaica got the rum. They go and march in. And old Harold, old, old Leon Bird rushed out of the Guinea grass and boop, boop, pushed the machete right through Harold. Hmm. And everybody say, Harold, pull the machete out, pull the machete out. And Harold say, I ain't finished drinking yet. Why should I pull the machete out? I'm going to bleed. They say, I'm going to bleed. I, I say, when I finish drinking, I'll pull it out. Hmm. So, so <laughs> they went down to Stradon. This machete, the handle on the side, and the blade on the side, in his side. Wow. And he drank all morning until when he fell right down. And they got a hammock. They rolled him in it. They carried down to the hospital, which was where the immigration office is now. Dr. Horder had one little, one little hospital there with two, with two beds. And so we rushed down there. And we were peeping through the glass, through the window, the little jealousy window. And there Dr. Horder was stitching him up with a big old needle. Sure. No bandages, put some thick plaster over it, and Harold went right back and drunk. Wow. And so, <laughs> old Leon, old Leon. Priorities. Old Leon, old Leon took off and went in the morass. That's what they call the, man, in the they call them mangroves now. We call them morass in those days. And everybody say, you got to keep your, your, your house door, your, 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 your house closed now, your window, because you, you have to keep your window open because there was no air, air, air conditioning, because Leon was loose. And a few days later, I say, boy, Leon is in, 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 in the police station. And I say, well, how, how is he in the police? They catch him? He said, no. He said, I'm a too thick. And he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't stay there in the morass any longer. So. Well, thank you for that, um, Dr. Steve. Um, again, a round of applause for all of our panel members, but certainly in the last to which to speak. And I digress.
I think I heard a member of the audience ask him to explain, explain, slow it down, the LBDNW. LBD and W. D and W. Light, bright, and damn near white. I thought it was light brown and damn near white. Light, bright, and damn near white. The first time I heard that phrase was from Dr. McField when he used it to describe my grandfather, a blessed memory. So thank you very much for that. Um, to Nasaria, um, you know, you are a poet, you are a storyteller, you are an author. Do you agree with uh, Dr. Roy's comments that the preserved history, which you believe are, we're losing, is very much an oral history and not that of a written history? I absolutely agree. And I think that that is where the work needs to go in. Um, we're talking about, um, Dr. Bodden said, now we're starting to write now. Um, but there are, there are a number of people that I've heard about recently that are writing, but nobody knows it because they're keeping it to themselves. And so we need to be able to reach people. You know, I was speaking to someone earlier about theater and about how taking theater into the community is an important thing because not everybody wakes up with that sort of experience that says, I'm comfortable being in the theater space. It's the same thing with anything that we want to develop. We have to reach our hands out and help those who are doing it quietly to, to share what they have and to understand the value of it. We need to record. Um, I've been putting these stories that you're telling and other stories. My mother says, you got to be careful what you see around me because next thing she you knows, it's in the newspaper um, because I've written something about it. But we need to gather these things and put them into the poems for Festival of Arts, which is what I did. That allows young people to start questioning, well, what is Black Garden? Garden? What does that mean? Right? And so that's how they learn. If we put it in the art, if we put it in to, to books and we write it, then we're on that road to getting this done. But I will say, we have to speak about this. You have to put funding be, behind it. We can no longer expect that all the people who are working in this area to keep our heritage alive can continue to do it on a voluntary basis. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, Dr. Bodden spoke about Maypole. We spoke about Quadrille. I think there's a young man here right now who teaches Quadrille. He only manages to do that mostly in Northside because that's where he's from, because um, he has to work a regular job. And then he doesn't get time to do the thing that he loves so much, which is to share the, our culture. The Maypole was danced at the agricultural fair, I know, at least six years ago. I saw one example of it. And um, so it's not that they're gone. It is that we, we are responsible for making sure that we do the work, that we provide the funding. We're also responsible for ensuring that we hold people who come here and say this is now their home, to that they're responsible for it too. And it should be first and foremost in any official event that we have. If we put it first and we demand that that is done, then we are okay to share in other people's culture. But we cannot allow our, ours to always be the last thing that, that, that shows up on the stage. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Ms. Suku, for that response. Turning to you, Ms. Alex, um, the point was made earlier on that it is possible one of the reasons behind our loss of Cayman culture is that in this otherwise melting pot that is called the Cayman Islands, representative of over 130 different nationalities, um, that it is possible that the other nationalities that we oftentimes praise ourselves um, are being lost in the tidal wave that is the other culture. Is that having an impact um, on our, I think the, the phrase was, capitulate, capitulating to other cultures at the expense of our own? Yes, I, I do believe that. But, uh, our, we're not, as Ms. Nasaria said, we need to have, the only thing that I can think about right now is when you have uh, the rundown hair. We need to do like, you know, you got the Filipinos, you got the Jamaicans, everybody's doing something on their culture, but we're not. And when I listened to what Ms. Masari was saying, I know about going around in Northside and I, I wish I had a recorder, I wish I could do this. Certain elderly in Northside that, 
like he said, I could sit there forever and ever and listen to the stories back in the 1900s or the 1800s, whatever. But nobody's putting it on pen. Nobody's putting it on radio. The things that these people know. I know it because of listening to my aunts, uncles, and the people, some of the people, that they're still living in Northside. Now they're in the 90s, 99 years mm -hmm. old, but can still tell good stories. Yes. But nobody's shutting it down. And I would like to see more someone in our community, even the whole island, let's put together and do something like that. Like when you go to the garden parties back in, back in the old days, because they don't do garden parties like they did then, but it was fun to go to them because those people performed. Mm -hmm. They didn't just speak the word, they performed the actions and you, right. you knew, believed and seen and knew what they were doing. I would love to see Cayman, Caymanians do the same thing as the other generations. You got the Jamaican dances, you got the Filipino dances, you don't have the Cayman things going on. Mm -hmm. It's like we forgot. We, we, we accepted everything else that came in. Yeah. And we're forgetting ours. Indeed. Indeed. Might I, can I just add of something course. to that? Um, and this is a good way then that we could connect with young people because they're into film. We miss a lot in the way that we express ourselves when you cannot see the facial expressions and, exactly. and your gestures. So if you get, young people are very technology savvy. If you have them helping with the filming and gathering of these stories, then we have, then we've begun that journey and right. we're teaching them. Right, yeah. that young man, that young man up there, I wish we could just clone him because he is very talented. Yes. What I would like to say in support of what you're saying, and. I, and I think Roy can, can support me in this. The Canadian people, too, um, being a minority as far as numbers are concerned mm -hmm. in North America, uh, uh, on, on their border in the south, yeah. the United States is 350 million people there. On the day. When we were in Canada, I think it was only like 26 million people. 26 million people. They, they, were, they, 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 they had the same problems that we're having now. Yeah. When Mr. Trudeau came into power, the first thing that they did out of, uh, out of a book called, um, what's it called again? By the, Carol, by the Levitts. Uh, anyway, it was a book that depicted the fact that we were, Canada was being dominated by the United States. Everything, even the hockey sticks that they, that culturally that they use, right. that was made in America. Wow. And Mr. Trudeau, tried to reverse that. He, he did reverse that by putting money and political will into the situation and started to, to have books that were written by Canadians into the schools and into the universities mm -hmm. and that all cultural things on the radio had to be 80% Canadian yeah. content. We're not doing that here. For, just for an example, in the morning I get up on Saturday, there's all this on the radio about uh, country investment countdown. Yeah. Why is why is it that we can't have put the political will and the financial um, backing behind it and and write some story about the the the, the, the Cayman story, for mm -hmm. instance, they they're in Canada, the Klondike, uh, all of those all of those plays are on 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 on, on Canadian television every week. Every week there's a different episode. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen here. We, we have the financial wherewithal to do it. Mm -hmm. We have radio station, we have government TV, but we're not doing anything like that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, uh, what I would like to see is, 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 is using those, that kind of technology to tell our story right. to the world and to, and, to our, and, to, and to the people who come in behind us. Mm -hmm. That's easy to be done. You can, you, can, you can hire people who can write s stories that, that can go on the, on the radio. On the television, that's 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 not being done. If we are to if we are to maintain our culture, we have to find the, the political will and the financial backing to do that. Otherwise, all we're doing is just coming to forums like this, talking, going away, feeling good about ourselves, and, to, and next week, and next year, and next generation, they'll be doing the same thing. They'll be doing the same thing. We talk about resources, and I, I want to touch on that, because when I look at our, our annual budget, um, the government budgets half a billion dollars in a variety yeah. 
of areas across the Cayman Islands, culture certainly being one of them. Um, millions of dollars going into national programs, preserving you know, historical sites. Um, but yet, as Nasaria pointed out, there are artisans who are living you know, hand to mouth who are trying to keep things like the quadrille and other dances alive. As a former legislator, uh, Dr. Roy, certainly as a former cabinet minister, um, are we spending the money in the right places? And or is it a matter that the budget for culture needs to be increased? Well, it's a bit of both. And when, when, I, when I look at jurisdictions, for example, like Jamaica and Barbados, I mean, Jamaica is, to my mind, the textbook case of a successful cultural entity. They might not have anything much going for them, but they certainly parlayed reggae into a world-famous product. And immediately you speak of Jamaica, reggae comes to mind, whether you're in Japan, whether you're in the Soviet Union, or anywhere else. Much like Trinidad and the Calypso and, and, and all these other countries. So we can do it. I think where we are short-sighted is that we look at the immediacy of the spin-off and we don't look generationally. We don't look down the line. We don't look 10 years from now. Because when you make cultural investments and when you invest in your heritage, you're not going to see that show up at the end of a calendar year. But you're going to see that in the next generation, next generation. the pride that the next generation of Caymanians of when they think of things came out. And we have lots of anecdotes, lots of examples, lots of products. And I want to make a plug for the National Archive. The National Archive was documented. All of the information we could ever need is right there. Just right. We have to find a way to mine it and put it into action. Why are these things not in the schools? Why are these things not, mm -hmm. not, that's, not that's taught? True. That's true. Very old young people are exposed to them. Why is it we have to be learning? And I want to say this, because right now, we're in a war. We're in a war for the soul of Cayman as far as our culture is concerned. Yes. A young man called me about a week ago today, very perturbed, and I will remember it to the longest day I live. I was having lunch with my son at home, and the young man said, I need your help. In my office, I am being bombarded. People are telling me we have no culture. They have come to rescue, the, to rescue us. Is this the case? I said, no, young man, that is not the case. He says, I thought so. I need some ammunition to fight them. Where can you point me? Because that is what People are telling us that is what detractors are telling us. We have no culture. I said that is the farthest thing from the truth. Because our ideas and our social activities tells me that our culture is just as strong as any other culture. Certainly there is no need for anyone from the outside to come and rescue us culturally. Because they can't. We have to rescue ourselves. Indeed. Yes. I want to... Thank you for that, Dr. Roy. And I want to talk about, pick up on what you're speaking of and, and ask the panel to participate, certainly from the perspective of lost opportunity. We see today in today's COVID world that our children um, are learning through technology. You know, my son has a Chromebook that he uses with his online learning. Technology is embraced by our young people and even so not so young, uh, like no time ever before. Dr. Roy just made the point that it's not a lack of cultural history, but access to that cultural history. When we talk about what is missing from the cultural component, um, we're making the comment that our history is largely an oral history. How do we preserve the written history, not so much in terms of the tangible books that you find in the library that you turn the pages, which I enjoy, maybe I'm old fashioned, but to reach the masses, to reach our young people in the schools, and certainly to reach those far and wide 
We all have many computers in our hands every day. Uh, should we be utilizing mediums like the internet? Should we be scanning some of these history books, some of those, I think the report of the West Indies you referred to earlier on, yes. uh, rather than going to the expense of reprinting that paper bound um, you know, uh, document, it's certainly cheaper to produce it online. We talk about CIG TV, we talk about uh, Radio Command. All of these media forums are striving, begging, pleading for content. That content could be in the form of culture, but we're not taking advantage of that opportunity that is, frankly, at our fingertips. Uh, Nasaria, Dr. Steve, Nasaria. Um, it's when, when we're, we need to move away from this idea of museums and those institutions hoarding stuff and protect it. I think that is part of the problem. It is, it is being held for the people of the country. So therefore, it should be made available to everybody easily. It is not easy, I'm so sorry to say this, but it's not easy to go to the archive. It's, you have to make an appointment. Yes. There's only a certain number of people who can be in there at a time. Now with COVID, it's even um, harder. But the, it's such a richness of information that's in there that it sh it, we need to find new ways to make it available. And we need to use the vehicles we have already. So the technology, um, we need to be making short films, we need to be l doing radio programs, as you um, have mentioned before. We need to continue writing, and, and I mean the Saturday morning poetry hour, um, you know, we, those are the things we need to keep developing. But how about if we start, if we're not able to do all that right now, I want to issue a challenge. Can everybody who's hearing this, please sit down with your children and somebody older and start asking questions and take your iPhone out and record it. Yeah. Let's start there yeah. so that it is not leaving with those when they pass, yeah. right? But it's absolutely doable and the young people are the ones who can also guide us in terms of using the technology in a, in a way that they know is accessible to them. Indeed, thank you very much, Ms. Arya. Dr. Steve, the same question, you know, well, are we losing opportunities sure that, are, losing that opportunities. are right in front of us? Um, to me, it's quite simple. I, I am not in the position to, um, to be able to have any, any positive action, action, but why is it that we spend so much money on all these other things that are going to be the tangible things that, that are going to be wasted and we have to redo them again in the next five years. Why is it that we're not spending money on, our, on education and our culture? It, it is because we have never honored education. Education has not, not, not been something that was very important to us from the beginning. From the beginning, my ancestors were some of the first people here who cried out for education and made petition to the Queen of England, Victoria, and, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the governor in Jamaica about their education when they, when they, when they sent the, the educationist from, from Jamaica, Michael, Michael Trust, in, 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 the, yeah, in, in the bottom town. And he wanted to teach the black and white children together. And they told him, no, no, you can't do that. And what he said, Ma, uh, uh, Mr. Malcolm, Malcolm. Said, Malcolm said, I will build a loft and put the black children upstairs and go upstairs and teach them and then come down. They said, no, 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 we can't do that. If you do that, you have to charge the, white, the black children six pence a, 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 a week. Well, they had just came out of from emancipation, or slavery. They didn't have any money, and he left. And my ancestors, um, who 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 signed, who got the petition and sent it off, they eventually had to go to different places. Some of them are in Nicaragua. Some of them are ambassadors now. David McPhee is the ambassador to Jamaica. Nelson McPhee, ambassador to, to Iran. All of those places. And so we have been fighting for this from from the 1800s, and yet we still haven't got anywhere because things like culture and education doesn't seem to be important in Cayman, but they're important to other nationalities who, who come in and so forth. Um, so you have to have the political will and use your resources to do this. I, to me, it's quite simple. There's no reason why we have the expertise here where you can't have write a story uh, about Cayman, start from the beginning, and every 
they, every week you have a different episode and episode and stuff and, and pay people to act it out and so forth. That's what we should be doing. We should be doing the finer things in life instead of cutting down mangroves to build, to build, to build cement buildings. There's, there is more to Cayman, like I say, than, 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 than cement buildings, cement buildings and so forth. But you see, it depends on the people who, who lead you. Because if, you didn't, if Canada didn't have people like, like, like Pierre Trudeau, they would probably be another province of the United States. That's, yeah. that, that's the reason why I'm making Definitely. that example. Definitely. You see? So, Definitely. so, so it, it comes from, from us, every one of us. And I hope that those who have the wherewithal and in a position to, uh, who are hearing our, our voices today, sit up and take notice and, and try to do something about the question that you pose. Because we'll be posing this question uh, ad finitum. And, and, and when I'm gone, and my grandchildren come along, they, they, they'll probably be a moderator like you two posing the same question. So it depends on us. But, but we are a people that we seem to only spend money when we can see next year that we're getting, if we spend $100, if we don't make 50 profit, that's not a good investment for us. Mm. They, they do not understand that that preserving your culture, preserving your culture, educating your people to the highest so that they can be... Just let me tell you this yes. before I go. As a young man, when I first went off to school, my grandfather gave me his crest for the Cayman Yacht Club. I got on the bus in New York and in, by, in Miami going to New York City. And when I got onto the bus, and I got to Norfolk, Virginia, uh, got onto the ferry that had to go across the Chesapeake Bay. Now they have a big, the, U, the bridge, bridge. Is, is, is one of the largest bridge and bridges in the world now, they say. And I got onto the ferry, and I was there, lying, in the line, waiting to get eat something to eat. And when I got to the window, the lady pushed, pulled the, the window down, and she went to the other side. I didn't know what was going on, and I stood there. And this guy came and said, uh, don't you see you on the damn wrong side of the fair ball? And I said, what do you mean? He said, it's the white side that you on. The color side is over here. And I was saying to myself, who the hell he think he is? He doesn't know I'm C. Macfield from Cayman. He doesn't, he doesn't know that I'm Lev Macfield grandson. <laughs> so, so that is the kind of, that is the kind of, a situation that we are going to still continue to be in. If we do not reinforce our children to have pride in who they are, who their children would be, and to always be about the rest of the crowd, that is the model that we should be telling our young people and our, and our children if we want to preserve our, ourselves. Several years ago, we had something called National International Day. What happened to that? Mm. Where everybody who live here, went to Lion Center or something and dress in their, their, their different costumes and cook their, yeah. their meals and interact with each other. What happened to that? Is, 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 is that that's gone? Why has that been uh, put, put, put in abeyance? Yes. It's, it's, I, I know why I wouldn't say it on the front TV, <laughs> but, 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 but all of us know, all of us know why. Indeed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Steve. And certainly I want to recognize Dr. Frank, Thank you. Uh, who is uh, just joining us now and certainly joining the, the, the panel conversation mid-flow, so if I can address this with you. Everything thus far, when we talk about potentially losing our culture, the panelists agree we need to do a better job at education. But yet when we look, Dr. Frank also, a former legislator, a former cabinet minister, so you know very well through the ages, what has been spent on education as a community. I think 2018, 86 million dollars went specifically just on public school education alone. We're not talking infrastructure, but curriculum and you know tools that facilitate the teaching experience. When we talk about Caymanian culture, is enough being spent, enough resources being provided to it, or in your interpretation, perhaps is it more than just money, Dr. Frank? Well, everything is more than just money. 
And um, as we know, uh, <laughs> we talk about culture, we talk about heritage, we talk about all these things because somebody found them in a textbook. And so those concepts and those ideas and the ideology behind it is imported into the Cayman Islands where you have not embraced people with the experience and the ability to do deep analysis of these things and what it meant in a historical context. So we misunderstand. And it's this misunderstanding that nobody wants to have corrected because they are feeling that if it's corrected, you're correcting them. We take our instructions from textbooks, from lectures, and from the impact they have on our own brain cells that motivates us to come to different relationships with reality as it is and needs to be for ourselves and our people. We have a conflict there. If the powers that be would embrace the intellectual energy which has been generated in this country now over 40 years, we wouldn't be here and asking these questions because the reason why this theater is here is because of a movement that started all the way back in the high school in the 1970s, led by one Jeff Presswell, who caused this place to be here, taught many students at the high school and outside the high school with the creation of the National Youth Theater which was the first performing arts theater in this country that focused on Caymanians. And the reason the National Youth Theater was started by Jeff Cresswell, an Englishman, is because the drama society that existed at that time claimed that we could not speak proper English. So it was a language issue from the very beginning, which is a cultural issue, essentially. Cresswell led this movement. We started the in-theater company at Royal Palms that became the Cayman National Theater Company, which became the cultural foundation. And there was a whole glory of the opening of this place with the sound of music. I had by that time written my first play, Time Longer Than Rope, which represented the Cayman Islands in Barbados in 1981. We have a whole history. Jeff Cresswell has a whole library. He's now given it to the archives. He's never been recognized. He's never been given status. He's been prohibited. We call that damnation of memory. When you damn your memory, you have nothing to go for towards because you, it is the past that guides us to the future, instructs us, and helps us to, to find that new Jerusalem. We cannot continue to punish creative thinkers and actors. We have to reward them. We have young people in this country that I've never seen a small society with such creative energy and music and art in other places. That art week in the Cayman Islands that was supported, it showed me the amazing energy that exists in this country that could be harnessed by private sector and by government. We need to allow people to speak their minds because we have to remember the psychiatrists and so, uh, psychologists say there is no central eye. We are all but players on a stage, taking instructions from our situations. We must not condemn people because of the situation that they find themselves in. If I go to give the minister a, 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 a suggestion and, and it's not proper, he doesn't understand, I go to jail, I, I, I get shot. I, I, I'm put in that situation, that's all medieval time, that's all slavery time. No, the minister must know that the instructions or the suggestions that are being made are of the best knowledge of the person who is given that information and therefore it should be valid, it should be considered and everybody who's attempting at least to give the best of their experience and their knowledge should do this. Money won't solve the problem. Listening will. Discussions will, but not money. You cannot throw money on solving these types of situations. So this is the beginning 
This is the investment that needs to be made. Thank you, Dr. Frank, for those powerful remarks. With the time that we have remaining, uh, I want us to focus on perhaps a solution-based approach. Dr. Frank, you just mentioned the, uh, you made the remark that if only our powers that be would listen and therefore act. Uh, well, we have the powers that be with us this afternoon. We have the Honorable Minister of Culture, and we're also joined by his Chief Officer for Culture. Both have been here for the morning session and the afternoon session, listening attentively, uh, and I think gaining much insight in terms of what is missing from this recipe. This morning, we were shared a quote from <coughs> Mrs. Mary Lawrence that read, the word heritage is defined as something that is passed down from preceding generations, a tradition. Know it, learn it, talk it, write it, sing it, paint it, but save it. It's your gift to the next generation. We've all talked about what we believe are the reasons why we are losing or have lost our Cayman culture. What, in your opinion, can be done more so than what has already been done to seek to preserve this culture for future generations? What can we be doing better, whether it be more of or perhaps embracing new initiatives? And Asaria, I'll begin with you again on this one. Well, I, I sort of would be repeating what I said before because I have spoken about solutions um, and I've talked about the fact that we, in order to preserve it, whatever vehicle we're using to do that, we need to include um, the younger generations because those are the, the ones that are going to then pass it on again. But um, in, in referencing what Dr. Frank was speaking about in terms of having conversations and those type of things, there's a lot that can be done individually um, right now that can, can go towards making a change in the future. And those are simple conversations and collecting and gathering these stories and sharing these activities. And I'll, I'll give an example. There, um, I recently met three um, visiting artists. They're on residencies here at one of the hotels. <clears throat> one of them that's gone back already said to me that, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready to leave this place that is, I think, <clears throat> I think he said, just so many things that I don't understand, and I, it's just it, it's just too much for me. And um, I met I met three of them just before they were about to leave. Like two of them were, were about to go, and they um, extended because then we started. I took the initiative to say, "Let's go. Let me show you these things. Let me take you to these places." Um, and they've now had a rich experience. Um, in knowing what Cayman really is, other than just the hotel, right? Um, these are the type of things that we need to be doing, but we uh, happen to be free and able to do it. It's not everybody who can do that. But it, it's valuable because one of, one of them is going to go back to the U.S. And, and the connection is with Haiti. Another one is going back to the Ivory Coast. And now they have a bit of us, and, we, and they've shared what is in their culture that is similar to ours, which then grounds me more and connects me more to the ancestors before me. And so the, the richness that came out of those, those interactions, it's gonna go with them to another country. The music they're gonna make is gonna be affected by what we're doing, what they learned and what they experienced. So there are so, I couldn't name all the ways that we can do this, it, it's so much stuff. And it's so rich, and the work is there to be done, and I'm excited about seeing it happening. But it's about starting with the little things that you can do right now, today, Indeed. Indeed. right? Thank you, Nasaria, for that. And certainly to your point, you may not have mentioned it, but perhaps some of the other panel members may offer their viewpoints on what can be done now. Same question to you, Dr. Steve. Uh, the minister and the chief officer are listening. Let's talk specifics. What can be done? that has not been done, or perhaps what can be improved upon that which is already happening to preserve Cayman culture. Pay people to write plays on Radio Cayman, um, convert Radio Cayman, stupid things about how many, how many songs are number one and number two in the world chart, and do something about how many children in Cayman can't read. 
and write and put that on, on the radio on, 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 on Saturdays and so forth. Commission people to write the story about, about Cayman. We have the history books. Um, Doc Frank is a playwright. Dr. Roy Bottle is, 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 is a writer. I am a writer. I'm sure that if they come to see us and we would get to collaborate to get together and write a, 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 a play that would depict uh, from the foundation to where we are today on radio. That's what we need to do and put on TV too. Sure. So all of the, all of the, all of the, all of the, all, all of the, the stuff that we're talking about is only academic. I, I, I'm a man of action. Um, get together and say this is what we want to do so people can see it, so children can see it. America has their, their David Crockett and their Wyatt, Wyatt Earp and they have all, all the things about Lincoln and all the things, they are us on TV, and they bombard that every, every day. And of course, <laughs> look at the commercials. Every time you put on YouTube, there's a commercial that comes to interrupt the songs that you want to hear. It's, but why do you think that is so? It's so that you can be indoctrinated into listening to, to do that. Yeah, we should be doing the same thing, because we are, we are 100 years behind the times. And, if, and, if, and in, this, in this global village, Time is moving so fast, and the culture is changing so fast that if we are not, we haven't even started to catch up with the other people a hundred years ahead of us. Yeah. So stop talking about what question we can do and get together and say, this is how much we have to spend. We want to write a, 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 a story of Cayman so people can, can read it, they can buy it on, in the stores, they can, and by the way, the other day my son came home and he was showing my grandchildren, what a cassette <laughs> looked like. They didn't haven't seen that in their lives. Right. Well, right. So people can buy these things. They can like, like her friend can go home and they can put it on, and they can they 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 they, they, they can sit down and they can they can see they have it in, they have it in England. They have it everywhere. They have it in, in places in the in the theater in, in Barbados. They call it. They have a place called Plantation, where where where, where the story of Barbados is told on stage. In Jamaica, they call it Yamaka. In Cuba, they call it uh, La Parisienne. Yeah. It's a three hours show where they show the history and the yeah. culture of Cuba from the time it, it, it was discovered. You know, you, know, um, you have to have imagination. And you have to have will. And you have to have, be a person of action to be able to change your society. That is my take on it. Thank you, Dr. Steve. I appreciate those comments. Uh, same question to Ms. Alex. At your I, introductory remarks, you made the comment specifically yes. that we were losing a lot of cultural heritage, in particular to our women, our women. those who built our first Cayman whilst the our men were at sea. Um, her cooks, the best cooks in the world, uh, the, the Cayman, Cayman Islands. But again, what, if, what do we export or do? I mean to say, well, our women did this. I am definitely for seniors because I've learned so much from them. But the things that those seniors, and I'm about to do, and I might probably hit you up, <laughs> I'm about to do my seniors in Northside. The younger generation don't know half of what I know about my people. When you talk to the younger generation about it, they don't know what we're talking about. But the sweetest, best stories in the world is what those people tell us. And I'd love to see something like that happen. And if I can speak to Ms. Teresa about that, that's one of the things I want to see. If someone come to me and say, can I record something in Northside about the people of Northside, the older people can give back to us, which we don't have. We don't have it. I go and sit down and talk to two particular people right now, and they can go back, and way back, like they said, oh, well, this happened in 1800. But it's not in the history books for us. But they know it. And I would like to see stuff like that happen. I would like to see more children learn more things as um, BJ. Mm -hmm. I wish more people, we had more young people like him that studied and, and take it to heart to be able to teach these people these things. Thank you so much. I really appreciate those remarks. <laughs> Same question again, looking to provide specific solutions to what is the missing ingredient um, from our culture mix that can guide uh, the stakeholders, to guide our leaders uh, to 
do more of? Dr. Frank, what is missing from this Cayman cultural experience and education in particular? Deep rooted analysis. That's what has always been missing. We have to understand that culture is dynamic and changeable. We have fixed culture that we adore and we worship. We make statues and we do that sort of stuff. But culture is about change. It's good to know how people operated in the past. It's good to know about touch rope, but touch rope was just about a very harsh form of earning a living. What about the character that comes from enduring that particular kind of lifestyle? Roy Borden writes in his book a stories my grandfather never told. Most people don't even understand what he's saying. But that's OK. Because if you, if, you, if you go deeply and analyze what he's saying, it becomes a part of your culture. It becomes a part of me, first of all, Frank McField, who reads that story. And I start interpreting it. And people start listening to it. And other people go to it. They see the meaning of this. and say, oh, this is Cayman. He created a, a, a fictitious village that he in, describes the entire political situation that has existed in the Cayman Islands. He does that in a few pages. But if you're writing a political diary about what happened, it'll take you forever. But you'll never embrace anybody with that. But you'll embrace them with a spirit and a story. Storytelling. The fact that we might go from oral story to written story, that's a transition that every society will make in the stages of developing. But the story, the magic of the story, the spirit of the story uh, changes. Oh, no, it remains actually the same, the soul, the, the soul of the story. Because the Bible says in the beginning, beginning in John 1.1, 1, 1, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And God was the Word. That tells you what we're discussing. We're discussing about the power and energy of the Word. The Jews say God loves stories or and stories love God. Because it's all about stories. The Bible is about stories. It's involving us in something that we can identify and feel so. So when I write time long on a rope or downside up and somebody comes and listens to it and feels it, that's a story. That's a ritual that has occurred. And when we appreciate that, we are all having the same similar experiences. It binds us together. That's how we know that we are the same, at least in enough ways, for us to call ourselves a community. When we lose the community, we lose the nation. The family is the most important part, of course. So children should be read stories by their parents. It all can't be done by government. It all can't be done by schools. There has to be also that support network within the home that is reinforced and encouraged to read to their children, to put off those, those the, the TV and put off those cell, cellular phones and start using your imagination and just don't let allow the people to be brainwashed. Imagine the competition of a small island like this competing against America, Iraq, and, 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 and different types of movies and different things like that. That would be like, we would just go down the drain. That is the reason why we have artists, we have in all kinds of forms that could be in the hotels. Government needs to support it. It's not just the Minister of Culture, it's the Minister of, 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 of Tourism as well that has to become involved. This has to be interactive and putting our people out there because when people say, oh, what elevates something and makes something good is not, if not the taste of other people say, oh, that tastes good, I'll eat that food again. Oh, that looks good, I feel good, I'll go back to that theater again. I love your art. What makes art important? Your judgment of it. And if we judge ourselves always downward, Frank McPhee wrote Time Long in a Row from 1979 and is just getting to the schools. Come on, guys, we know what the problem is. The problem is tribalism and individualism that is not constructive. We need to defend our collective consciousness, preserve it, not just in things, but in our relationships with each other. 
Thank you, Dr. Frank. Certainly do appreciate it. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Roy Bodden, in your introductory remarks, you made the statement that we are in the Cayman Islands making some effort to attempt to preserve our cultural heritage. Again, I ask you the same questions I ask your fellow panelists. What is the missing ingredient? What can we do? What can the powers that be take away from this afternoon's panel discussion to improve the level of preserving Cayman heritage for future generations? Dr. Roy Bowden. The missing ingredient is because we have never had an appreciation for intellectuals in our society. We measure prosperity and progress by material success. Where one lives, what one drives, what kind of job they hold. But we never measure their success on what kind of ideas they propose, what kind of intellectual products they leave, what poem, what stories, what interpretation, what song. So we, and we have allowed other people to come and set the agenda, the cultural agenda. They've set, first of all, the economic agenda. Now they're trying to set the political agenda and then they tell us we don't have a culture. So they scuttle the cultural agenda. So we're in a battle. I read a book, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual by Harold Cruz. Professor Cruz says that the problem with the black people is that too often we suffer from what he calls historical discontinuities. We let other people from outside come and set our agenda. That's, true. That's the reason I write. I'm not depending on the government to buy my books and put them in the schools. They will never do that. Or perhaps they'll do it after my bones are bleached, as my dear departed mama used to say. But I write them because I have a compulsion. And like I told my students all those many afternoons, Friday afternoons at East End, I want, to, it is my moral obligation to pass these things on, to pass these le lessons on, to write them down, much as the Jewish scholars wrote down for their progeny to read and write. I'm not waiting on the government. I publish as much as I can afford. People ask me, why are you spending all this money? I said, you know what? If nobody reads them, I read them myself. And every time I read them, although I'm the author, I learn something new. <laughs> I learn something new about myself. And That's I learn right. Something new about my sister. <laughs> That's so until we in the Cayman Islands develop an appreciation and develop an intellectual culture, we will always be paddling against the stream. So we have, to, we have to do that. If the government comes in, it's fine. But if they don't, and it has to begin with the man in the mirror. I have to begin with educating myself, with developing pride in myself, with telling myself, you have cultural worth. You might not have an American Express card in your wallet, but you have cultural worth. Look, it's a badge of honor for me. I've written six books. I'm, I'm working on three now trying to work out a reasonable rate with my publisher because I self-publish. And one of these days, I tell my son, one of these days when I'm dead and gone, you'll be famous because these works will be selling and you will have the intellectual property to them. So you hold on to them. I know more commanders need to do that. I begin by educating my household. I tell my children who we are. My paternal grandfather was a patriarch. Tell him who we were, where we came from, and we should be proud. And that's what we have to begin in Cayman. Every household, however humble, has a story to tell. Yes. We Thank have you. To begin. Thank um, you very, very Ms. much. Mr. Moderator, yes. I'm not trying to have the very last word. <laughs> but I, You'll I end needed, up with it. I just needed to piggyback and say that one of the things that we really need to do in this country is to learn to separate the man and the woman from their works. I'm tired of hearing of people, oh, he's mad, she's mad, because they have an idea that challenges what we think is the status quo. And we need to look at our intellectuals and understand 
that what they're giving us is all their gifts and stop judging people by those things you see them doing on a weekend. We've got to be more mature than that. Indeed. Indeed. Well, again, I think the audience reaction is as it should. I want to thank our panel members, and I want to thank our live studio audience as well as those tuning in via Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I don't believe it's a stretch to say that uh, both this morning and this afternoon's conversation has been vibrant, insightful, and informative, and I thank you all for your time. A round of applause for our panel members, please. In closing, I would like to, I see the minister stepping up to the plate, so I will call on the Minister for Culture, the Honorable Bernie Bush, to uh, give us some closing remarks and um, perhaps the presentation of gifts in this special cultural presentation, Caymanian Proud, a time to remember. Minister. Preserving our past, strengthening our future. This was the chief officer and staff and myself. This is something that we sat, we figured what, where can we start? What made me feel good is to hear Mr. Steve talk about an English governor of the past that tried to make sure that everyone was equal in some way or form. Gov, you showed up today. We hope the future will show that we can talk about you in the same way. So far, I've worked with you, and just the fact that you took time out, I know what's going on, why my colleagues were not able to come here today, but you took time to come. Thank you, Gov. Appreciate it very much. Austin, once again, with that beautiful voice that I'm jealous of. Every time I say it, I wish I had that voice. If I had that voice, I wouldn't even be a politician. I would just be out there just making money. <laughs> but thank I'll let you know how that works out. <laughs> but to the panelists, I really do appreciate the honesty, the frankness, and this is what myself, I'm known for being straight up on most things. My staff is trying to teach me how to be politically correct, which is very hard for me. But I do know this. I have a chief officer and office and the staff that is especially concentrating on heritage and culture. They are very serious. You all, we have more of these things planned. There will be a lot more. And you all will be included on in helping to guide us or help, helping us to reach these goals. Chief Officer, thank you for all your hard work and your, and your dream is coming, it's starting. We are going to preserve our past and we will strengthen our future. Thank you all very much, God bless. Includes our presentation, but uh, by all means, stick around. Have an opportunity to chat one-on-one -on -one with our panel members. I see uh, another young lady making her way to the podium, I guess, with the presentation of gifts. So I give you the opportunity, ma'am, to, uh, well, to say what you need to say. Good afternoon. We would like to give thanks to the panelists and the moderator for participating today. All who came out or watched live, the managing director and staff of the Kimber National Culture Foundation, Mr. Linford Wilkes, video production specialist, and the entire government information services staff, who made it possible for the public to watch, especially during this time of public restrictions, the team from the Ministry of Youth, Sports, Culture, and Heritage, anyone else that I might have missed, thank you for making this a success. We look forward to seeing you at our next event in Cayman Brac on the 5th of November. So please listen out for further ads and information. I now invite the ministry representatives to present the panelists with a token of our appreciation. Thank you. <laughs>